welcome back to my view from the piano bench. We do this every Wednesday night here on my Joe Holtz Notes YouTube channel. The videos premiere at 7 p.m. unless something goes wrong, which can happen. But hopefully tonight we're on track and hopefully we're all on track with where we want to be, which is kind of the theme tonight. Last week, if you watch this regularly, oh, and by the way, speaking of watching regularly, thank you so much to those of you who provide support and encouragement along the way via the means available on the support page of my website. You'll see the link in the description. Thank you for checking that out and uh, poke around and keep in touch and all of that. So if you watched last week's video it was entitled knowing who you are because the starting point for doing anything is right where you're standing who you are and where you are and that's where whatever you do comes from and particularly in creative expression uh, it's really connected to us personally you know, playing the piano is not like, you know, learning, oh boy, this was going to be a data reference, learning uh, how to type on a typewriter. Oh, my goodness. But of course, you know, when I came up in school and people before me, that's what we had. You know, uh, you took typing class or you didn't. But, you know, it's like press this down and this happens. And so a lot of people look at playing the piano that way, kind of like data entry. Uh, well, I should shouldn't say a lot of people, a lot of musicians don't, but when you look at it from afar, it's just like press the button and something happens. But really, when you express through the piano, the piano's an extension of you. Even when you lean on it and the note inadvertently goes down like that. Uh, and tonight's topic is kind of a part two. So if you haven't seen the other one, you could watch it or not. I think this will still make sense. And we're calling this topic, I keep saying we, all of my multiple personalities are calling this topic, Why Piano Lessons Fail. And that's actually kind of a, a, a big deal. It's not something that you would think about uh, necessarily, except like, let's say you have a child and you want to start beginner lessons. You know, uh, you hope it works. And sometimes it takes and sometimes it doesn't. But there are reasons why, and there are definitely uh, things you can do, understandings you can have, approaches you can take to maximize the chances of the piano lessons taking or not taking, or music lessons in general. Now, I do need to say this is not just about music. Hopefully, what I'm saying can be generalized, because uh, this isn't just for one like narrow group of people, at least hopefully, typically. So hopefully you'll get something out of this uh, wherever you are. So the temperament of the student is a starting point and we're, we're, where the teacher has to find a match. That's kind of where we're going. And there's a lot of variations on that theme or not, especially with beginner piano teachers. But, like I just said, the starting point is wherever you are, whoever you are, because that's a given, right? So, I can't help that. Don't blame me. <laughs>
Don't blame me for falling in love with you. Of course, we're past Valentine's Day, so a little, little Valentine's Day holdover. Should I admit it? Well, okay. We know these aren't live streams anymore. We used to do it on Facebook until Facebook got weird. And my internet's already weird. So I record these a day or two ahead of time. And I recorded this on Valentine's Day. After I went to the local retirement community to uh, play in the, uh, the lobby or the lounge for the uh, Valentine's Day dinner. That's why I'm... I'm in costume. <laughs> Not really. Well, yeah. I don't usually wear this shirt. That and the, 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 the pink shirt that comes out typically once a year. So, where was I? I have no clue. Uh, so, last week's video, I detailed my personal journey as a musician and from that, the, the path of self-discovery, but largely without a tour guide. And that made it, <laughs> so, well, it's always a lifetime process, but, you know, you would think it would have gone faster or easier if I had people showing me, like, I'm able to do in some cases with people who didn't, who I recognize that they can have the advantage of my understanding what's going on and helping them. But you know what? Everybody's path is actually what it needs to be. Learning curves are just long for me no matter what. So maybe I shouldn't blame not having a tour guide, but I'm not blaming. So I had teachers teaching music while at the same time, and I can recall many examples of this, I navigated the inner tensions that it brought. And, and you, might, you might think if you're not a musician, well, music is music. And no, not yet. Well, ultimately, everything's complicated. Uh, but there were many frustrations along the way, which never made me not want to learn because I was too driven for that. It did leave me frustrated and confused at many points along the way. But I, I was I was too motivated. This is this is what I do. So, uh, you know, I remember my dad singing this song to me, and I did not intend to grow up to be a mule.
driven in person or an ambitious person or one who couldn't sit still, <laughs> you know, they have this diagnosis today that they didn't have when I was a kid. You know, ADHD, which I learned is attention deficit and high definition. Uh, yeah, and when I was a kid, though, I was a child in the 60s, and no one had thought of ADD yet. What was my diagnosis? It was, hey, you, settle down. You know, so I always uh, have been the fidgety type, and I take that energy and hopefully put it to, to good use. So uh, I mentioned last week that my piano teacher, although he couldn't teach me anything about improvisation, he validated me, excuse me, essentially by leaving me alone and gave me the one little piece of advice that he could come up with, which is D flat is a good key to try to improvise in. And he would demonstrate it to, to, to not much effect, <laughs> you know, but he didn't tell me I was wrong. And like I said last week, I didn't realize how huge that was until I was contemplating that uh, last week. But man, by the time that I was in college, that's when it really hit the fan. Uh, and I was confronted with uh, the dramatic differences between how I was being taught as a classical pianist, because that was my major, and essentially how my brain worked. You know, and the frustrations and lessons for different reasons is the large part of why I dropped out of college after the first year, got my act together after two and a half years of playing full time. And, and came back and finished with a wonderful teacher, but still had frustrations, different frustrations. But uh, my my little tin of anison or whatever the, the aspirin du jour was, bear, you know, uh, always came with me to the lessons because I always had to always had to get into that tin to fix the headache. By the time I was done, uh, it was it, it 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 was stressful, uh, and. Part of this is that I didn't have the experience of uh, really serious classical piano instruction until I was in college, with the exception of maybe six months or so before my audition. Because I, I had a beginner teacher, and I really didn't go beyond that beginner teacher. Uh, and I kind of just f found my own way after he had passed away and you know I had outgrown him by that time anyway and when I decided since I was expected to go to college and really had no ambition toward it that I would major in music and that's what I did and then I discovered oh I had to take an audition I have to play these classical pieces and I have to do this oh you know let's get a real teacher <laughs> so so we, so we found someone but six months before the audition who initially thought I was crazy or my dad was crazy, but then, you know, after the first lesson, it's like, no, we're good. And she didn't challenge my temperament. In fact, she was another one who didn't have anything to teach me, couldn't improvise, but also validated me. Uh, and I, I remember the one real piece of advice, at least the one that stuck that she gave me, because what she would do, uh, is give me musical principles that would parallel both sides of the street. And and one was, and, and, and this I've carried with me, this is like, look, I, this one little thing is like probably worth the price of all the lessons that, that was paid, with, that were paid, that she was paid for, uh, which is that in general terms, the maturity of a phrase uh, is can, it can be observed in, by its length, and that was a poor way of putting it. Like a longer phrase is probably a more mature phrase. It's like a longer sentence. Like when a young child is learning how to speak, and they say one word, then they say you know two, they me want or you know daddy out or whatever, and then. 
as the maturity comes in the communication, the sentences get longer because they, they carry more meaning. And you know, I'm not talking about the run-on sentences or the pointless words, but, but, but you know what I mean. And so, so her point was that you know, a phrase, and I can't even play it right. <laughs> extends out. It's not just two notes, and I'm not even going to attempt to play because that part of my brain isn't working with this. Uh, and so when I'm improvising, you know, if I just play like little, little short phrases, it's like C spot, run, C, dig, J spot, you know, so seek to develop an eloquent sentence when I'm improvising, like in the classical pieces. That was actually great advice. Uh, but once I got in, in the college, and particularly the, you know, the, the one marquee teacher I, I, I had, I'm very, very grateful for. But, but what the whole thing was, was not but, the whole thing was learning the minutia of how to do something and learning about it and how to think it and how to move it. And, and then you'll take that little thing that you spend like three weeks of lessons on like one little phrase, one little piece, and then you insert that in the whole thing. And that's putting a jigsaw puzzle together, right? And you've probably heard me say this before. I remember sitting there thinking, would somebody please just show me the target so I can point my bow and arrow at it. And that was a frustration of expressing well, I'm really frustrated now because I can't seem to express anything in coherent English. <laughs> uh, that was expressing my frustration at being challenged for myself to be able to do this thing which I really wasn't suited for, or at least it didn't, didn't feel that way. So uh, the place where I've heard some teachers start with this or talk about it and it's a little simplistic but this is a good place to start is learning styles uh the uh the marquee teacher i had in the jazz side of the street would talk about learning styles and you know from time to time recognize that you know my learning style was not you know what he typically would encounter or what, what his was or, or whatever so sometimes he would acknowledge it and sometimes he wouldn't and so it's frustrating on that side of the street too. So thinking about learning styles, I'm going to say you cannot overstate the impact positively or negatively on a beginner student's initial piano lessons for an adult or a child, but especially for a child, because you can have conversations with an adult, you know, about their temperament and about their goals and about what, can, what they can see themselves doing. Uh, you can have those conversations with an adult that you can't have uh, with, a, with a child. And a young parent of a young child, you know, is not necessarily thinking anything but, you know, let's, let's learn little Johnny some piano, right? Uh, and if you're going into piano lessons blind, it's kind of a crapshoot whether the temperament of the teacher and the student will match, or if the teacher is flexible enough to match the temperament of the student. And I'm going to say something maybe controversial. Most teachers are not flexible enough. But in my case, I detailed a couple of teachers who weren't flexible enough to match my temperament, but were validating of what my temperament was, which was, which was important. So if we do just a dichotomy, we make it re real simple, and we say classical versus jazz, or structure versus freedom, right? Uh, there are going to be people who are going to be more responsive to pulling the information off of the page, processing the information, uh, and then producing music from that information. And that's just not because that's how music is often taught, 
that's because that works for that person, right? Uh, but then there is the person who kind of always sees the big picture. And if they're given information, they're going to just sort of like, okay, good. And then they just put it in, you know, the blender of all the other information. And if all you're supposed to do is take specific information and replicate it, when, you're, when your personality is throwing it in the blender, the big picture thing, looking for the big thing, you know, that that's a that's an that's an ongoing tension right uh and whatever way you naturally do things is going to be the way that you are going to be drawn to do them and if you're not given that opportunity that's the tension that is going to often drive the uh, bus of the piano lessons off the rails, if that makes any sense. Uh, now, like I said, it's easier with an adult student because you can ask questions that will kind of help you understand. Like I said last week, you know, you ask a question like, you know, when you're, when you're speaking in front of a group, uh, are, you, are you more comfortable with the prepared text that you've written out and practiced, or are you more comfortable just kind of knowing your subject, maybe, you know, practicing in the car while you're driving, you know, without reading anything. And then you just get up and you just kind of go and you have a few notes to remind you what you want to say. And that will tell you what, what side of the street that you're on. Uh, now, there are basics that every beginner should know, obviously. But the fork in the road shows up really early uh, in, in terms of being able to meet the temperament of the, of, of the student. And let's put it this way. If you have somebody who really responds well to reading music, but then you insist that all they do is learn to improvise, that's going to be a wall that's going to drive them back to wanting to, to go through the path of reading music because that's what works for them. That That's what works for them, if, if that makes sense. You're going to be drawn to the way that, you know, of least path of least resistance. But if you're somebody who is drawn to improvise and all you're allowed to do in your music lessons is put the music in front of you and, and read it exactly as written, if you don't do that, you're wrong. You know, why would somebody work really hard to get someplace where they can get there easier another way, path of least resistance? And, and yeah. So the direction opposite of the temperament, of the, if you take the direction opposite of the temperament of the student, that's where the frustrations and the tensions. And before long, the student quits. That's how it happens.
Let's call the whole thing off. No, let's not. Let's, <coughs> excuse me. Let's figure out how to make this work. So the thing that I will never do is say that there's only one correct path, one correct way. And I said this again last week. Uh, I seldom say it right or wrong. I'll say better or worse or more or less effective because I really believe that's true. Uh, and, you know, th there are times when you have to just keep trying different doors of the house. Keep knocking on different doors of the house until one of them opens. And it may be a house that has 150 doors, right? You're going to get in somewhere. And you just keep you just keep trying, but you don't keep trying the same thing. You just take different angles of entry, and then one of them takes. And then when you're when you're inside, you're inside. If that if that makes any sense. Uh, and I'm pretty persistent about that because I I, I believe that strongly. So uh, the different paths that you can lay out even from the beginning, where you take concepts for the beginner that like, were only taught to me like in college, but it's like, why wouldn't you teach these concepts to, to, to a beginner? You know, about time signatures versus meter signatures. You know, now I'm gonna talk specific music for a minute. Four, four, the time signature, the meter signature does not mean there are four beats of measure and a quarter note gets one beat. Six eight certainly does not mean there are six beats in a measure and an eighth note gets one beat. Six eight means there are actually two pulses in a measure and it's triple meter. What? But there are ways you can you can teach that. You can teach that expression to, to, to a young student. Now, some students really need that knowledge base detail think about but other people are like, oh it feels like that i can do that so i'm going to give the student every opportunity that i can come up with to go both ways and the advantage that i have is that most of my training is classical training and part of that is circumstantial in that if there was such a thing as a jazz major when i went to college i might have taken it I'm really glad that it wasn't the case. And, but, but I also came up in only having classical lessons. That's all, that's all I understood. And there's a part of me that's still, that's really important to me. I'm really glad I, I, I have that. And I've had good teachers and one wonderful teacher particularly. But then I have this whole other jazz improv thing that I've also had to study with. But a lot of that was just, you know, letting my intuition take me someplace and then I could teach from that and see if this makes sense. And I've shared this with, with, with another friend, a uh, music teacher in a similar situation who, who validated this. When you teach somebody something that you were able to figure out on your own, you actually wind up teaching it to yourself because, because then you have to, you have to organize it in a way that, it wasn't organized when it was given to you. So you're looking at it, you're deconstructing it. You're taking the jigsaw puzzle apart, right? Uh, and it's like, whoa, okay, cool. And then you, you give them the pieces back and then you put those pieces back, uh, back together. So to an extent, I can be two different piano teachers. And it is not an unheard of thing, in fact, uh, particularly for a serious jazz younger students, it's a very common thing to have two teachers. You have a classical teacher and you have a jazz teacher. Uh, if, 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 if you're really serious, you have two lessons each week, you practice your butt off. Right? Uh, and at a certain level, of course, I'm not going to be able to, to, to go there. I'm not one of these you know, people who's like, this brilliant musician, the, uh, great musician on either side of the street and certainly not both at the same time uh but hopefully i've got more than nothing uh so that 
jazz side of the street. I learned to develop that intuitively. Uh, really until well into my, my, my 20s, because most of my training was on that other side of the, the, the street. So which side is the sunny side of the street? Well, maybe maybe the sun's just out all the time, as long as you're not looking at the clouds. I don't know. take a little little detour. Uh, the ability to have kind of free brain space to think while I'm playing can <laughs> can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, especially when I'm looking at my playing and trying to like put a value on it or, or judge it, which is something you're, you're never supposed to do. And then you get, then you get distracted by that. <laughs> and to be honest with you, this whole time, I'm thinking not just my playing, but my words, nothing is making, making sense. But while that was being played, uh, for about two minutes, first two or three minutes, maybe of, of playing that, I had this amazing mental clarity about what I wanted to say the rest of the time. Uh, and if that's happening while I'm practicing, there's a fork in the road. Because it's like, really, you want to practice detachment because those things come and then you just let them go. You let them go away. But if you let them go away because you're in this other moment, it's gone. Right? And 
So I'm having this clarity about what I want to say. Now, I think you've already kind of deduced. I have no idea what that was. <laughs> so it's like, how do I keep that in my head? Well, I really can't, you know, unless I just kind of stop and start writing it down or start talking right then. And I chose not to do that. So I'm just sharing that because you might find that interesting about my process or you might just have another reason to roll your eyes at me. So I'm going to go back to my notes, which I've trashed a long time ago because I've been jumping all over the place and I'm aware of that. Uh, in fact, the next thing that I was going to say was that if someone can improvise easily, it will be harder and less desirable for them to be required to learn exclusively in a classical regimen. And it works the other way. Okay, one thing that, that, that I did want, want to say. Uh, mechanics of playing the piano, you know, physical mechanics, they're just, they're, they're givens, and you have to do that. But I'm talking about the, exp the expression. It's like if somebody, like, knows that, hey, I, I wanted to learn, you know, to some chords, and I want to learn how to play some popular songs. You know, and they have songs that they might want to play. Okay. And, and sometimes, like, a younger child will, will, will know that. Then would you say, well, we can't do that until you go through beginner lesson book one, two, three, and four. And play all these little songs that you don't care about. Well, I mean, that's complicated. Because there's stuff you have to learn those beginner lessons. But... You know, reading music like that, building a foundation for classical playing, isn't going to help you do this other thing. But you can build that foundation too. And ideally, of course, you want to build both foundations. And in an ideal world with, with, with a piano student, as far as, I, as far as I can take this, I'm building both sides of the fence. Now, it's kind of happening slowly because I'm taking you know, the time of, of, of one lesson and, and I'm doing the two teachers thing, right? But I'm doing it in order to kind of see where that person is going to take root. And then once that person takes root, then you kind of change your, change your tack because now you find out what side they're on. But you always want to keep your hand or your fingers or your whatever in both sides because... All coins have two sides, right?
So one phrase I'll often come to is, perform to your strength, practice to your weakness. And, and that's something that as a performing musician, uh, I put really tight boundaries around what I perform. Uh, because I know what I can do effectively and I know what I can't. You know, it, it, it's like back some years ago, I got this goofball idea that I was going to regurgitate the time when I was a classical organist <laughs> uh, to whatever extent I, I, I was. And it's a whole different experience playing, you know, a, a pipe organ or a pipe organ simulated thing. Uh, and uh, I did that for 11 years, actually beyond after I retired from the position, I would still go back and sub. Uh, but I would also play improvised piano in the, in, in, in the same service. So it was like schizophrenia training when I was uh, early, early on. Uh, and that was actually, it worked for me, right? Uh, but there came a point where it's like, you know, I just have to just do the thing that comes naturally. When I say it worked for me, it was fulfilling to, to do. It was, it, it was a challenge. So I actually, you know, threw out my organ master shoes, uh, which are, you know, particular shoes that you use for pedaling, you know, the, the, the big pedals, not the little sticks, but uh, the, the big kind of keyboard for your feet. Uh, and then the church I was involved in, you know, where I wasn't the musical director playing, it was an organist. But when I summed, it's like, you know what? I could sub, I could play the organ again. And I actually bought a new pair of organ master shoes. And I started this little journey for maybe maybe a year. And and I got to a certain point doing it uh, where I said, why, why am I putting all this time and effort into something so that I can like elevate myself to the level of mediocre? <laughs> it's really what it was. I was never going to be a strong you know, classical organist. And it's like, you know, no, no. And it's, I, I, I put that aside. That was like my last little detour. I took lots of detours when I was younger with different instruments and stuff. But that was, that was the end of that. And it's like, this takes all of my time and expression, right? So that's related to, 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 to what I'm talking about. So I've mentioned, you know, one example of my, crisis in classical instruction, where it was teaching me that my learning approach, you know, my temperament was really different. But I had a similar crisis on, on the jazz side, uh, which, which, which is related to this, because I came in uh, to jazz instruction uh, thinking that there's all this stuff I had to learn. And in a way, I was thinking like I need to burden myself with the same kind of burdens that threw me off on the classical side. And all this information came at me and it was way too much to organize. And then I finally came to realize that I had learned how to do this intuitively and that was my path. I say it differently now. I say I only have a wide angle lens. And you just learn to live through that lens. So my you know, three years of jazz instruction with this more marquee uh, teacher, the biggest thing I got out of it was coming to understand that you can't reinvent your own wheel, and I already had a wheel, you know? Uh, so struggles in music lessons are <laughs> uh, not unusual. And I like to think that I can empathize with that and I can help a student through that. Uh, anyhow, uh, so I'm going to just read what I wrote because I have no idea because I can barely read it. Yes, here we go. Uh, so you grow the student to express through their temperament while you challenge them to grow on the other side because everyone can. Uh, ex example, and you may have heard me say this, uh, when a classical musician uh, says, man, I 
taking lessons all my life. I do all this playing and I can't improvise. What's wrong with me? And it, it's like, nothing's wrong with you. You just, <laughs> uh, you just happen to flip the switch to be able to do it. But I can't do it. Yes, you can do it because everybody can do it. No, I can't do it. Are we having a conversation? Yes. What are we doing? Are we reading from prepared text? Did we rehearse this? What are we doing? We're improvising. Guess what? Your brain works. You can improvise. Oh, and you know, you, you, everybody can. And if you can have a conversation and you're a musician and you know the language enough, you can improvise. Doesn't mean that that's going to be your primary expression. In fact, that's going to be the thing that frustrates you. You, you know, uh, I'm kind of painting this in another light. The thing that frustrates you is still something that you can do. You just don't want to do it because you can get somewhere else easier. But there comes a point where, if this makes sense, the inability to do it at all becomes a bigger frustration, uh, particularly to, to classical musicians. You know, And then and then once it becomes a big enough frustration, and then their assumption that they're just uh, capable is challenged, then you can then you can open open up to it. It's just that the the path of that is so unlike this that you're trying to go through here or from here through here. And the illustration th that I give, because I'm not going to go real deep into this uh, different topic, uh, is to do it the way you were taught and bring that over to improvisation is like trying to have a conversation where you're forced to spell every word while you're speaking which would completely derail the conversation, you know. But the point is that we're all capable of learning different ways. And then we all have a way that works best for us. And for some of us, it's really deeply, deeply there. And if we find that, we learn to express through it. That is so fulfilling. Sometimes we're frustrated because, because we're looking at what we can't do as a, rather than what we can. You know, and if, and if you... If, that's kind of like the glass half full, half empty thing. And if you're having that problem in piano lessons, you might be having that problem other places too. So, yeah, I, I guess we all just, you know, need therapists, <laughs> right? So, I'm going to just keep going here. So, uh, it is the very few who are equally gifted on both sides. And for serious students, because of that, Two teachers are not uncommon, and I said this. And to a point, I can be both, and I said that. Typically, especially with beginners, it's not the case. Uh, oh, okay. Typically, it's, I know what I was, was trying to say. Uh, there is a school of thought that says that when you're learning piano, you change teachers every 18 months. I'm not sure where they get 18 months. Uh, and... Because what you do is you you get different perspectives on it as you as you grow, and that's actually a a, a good thing. Uh, what I, what I would say is that don't hesitate to change teachers. Teachers understand this, and find a teacher that can meet you where you are temperamentally. And I'm talking as if you're taking lessons and most likely you're not, but hopefully you can get something out of this. And then once you find that, you may have to go through several teachers. Just believe that that's the case. Believe that there is a path for you. And then when you find somebody who can help you access that path, then then you just ride the wave, and that's the wave that will take you where you want to go.
All right, well, I hope this made some sense. So I'm just going to, I made a decision while I was playing it. I'm going to play one more tune. And if you're watching this around the time, you know, it goes uh, live, near the time I recorded it, you'll see on my Facebook page that I shared one of uh, Emmett Cohen's uh, single video posts from his Monday night stream. Uh, and I just commented, yeah, you know, uh, it was, uh, it was fun to be distracted by it last night. Uh, that particular treatment of it was cool, and it's a tune that we all know, and I just feel like playing it. this later I have no idea what to expect thank you for watching thanks for being here and stay in touch join me tomorrow night for piano for my friends and I look forward to seeing you soon thanks so much